So the rate laws that we've looked at so far, they're okay. But as I mentioned, you know, if a car travels 84 miles in two hours and we say that its rate is 42 miles per hour, that doesn't necessarily tell us what's going on throughout the whole trip. Um, so what we want to do here is integrate time in with concentration. And that's what these integrated rate laws do. It's a relationship showing how a reactant concentration changes over a period of time. And we can use them to predict concentrations at all different times of the reaction. You know, how long does it take for a reaction to be halfway done, or 75% done, or even 90% done? And we can also look at some graphical data that is going to help us determine a reaction rate law. And we'll be doing a lab with that. And calculus is going to give us these relationships, but we don't have to know calculus in order to do these problems. So first up, we'll focus on the first order rate law. So here we have a reaction, and what we know so far is that the change in the concentration of my reactant over the change in time is the rate for a f any reaction. So a first order, I'll get K times the concentration of A. Calculus will give us the integrated rate law of being the natural log of A sub T, that's the concentration of my reactant at time T, divided by the initial concentration, A sub 0. And that's going to equal negative KT. So now we have time in our equation. And that is one way to look at it. On the AP um, formula sheet, they write it as this, which is the same thing if you know about ma uh, logarithmic math. So I've got the log, natural log of A sub T minus the natural log of A sub 0 equals my negative KT. So what we can do with this, as it says there, is when we're given the initial concentration and the rate constant, we can calculate the concentration of our reactant at any given time. Or we can find the time it takes for that concentration to get to a certain value. I know, goosebumps, right? So let's see that in action. So here we have a reaction, the decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide. It's first order, and that's the rate constant at 45 degrees Celsius. So if the initial concentration is 1.65 times 10 to the negative 2 moles per liter, what is the concentration after 825 seconds? So we know it's a first order reaction. We know that that is the rate law, or we will know it, and the integrated rate law. So now we just plug and chug. All of the information is given to me, so I simply plug it in. So the natural log of my dinitrogen pentoxide at at my time, 825 seconds, minus the natural log of my initial concentration equals negative K, there's my K, times T, 825. Do be careful here. Okay, you see that my K is given in inverse seconds, and my time is in seconds. So when we do the KT multiplication, you do want to make sure that those match up. Sometimes they might give you the K in minutes or the time in minutes and you just have to make sure that those two match up so that when those two numbers are multiplied together it becomes unitless. So clean that up and I'll just click on these and you can pause the video if you need to record it or write it down but when you plug and chug that's my answer and it makes sense. My concentration has decreased from the initial concentration and so that is a good mathematical answer. Piggybacking on that how long would it take for the concentration to decrease to 1 times 10 to the negative second moles per liter? Again, we have all the information. We plug and chug. Now I know both concentrations. I know the rate constant still. I'm solving for time. How long will it take? So again, cleaning that up, plugging and chugging away, and we end up with that many seconds or minutes. And again, they can ask you, they could say, how long will it take in minutes? But otherwise, just we know that the answer is going to come out in seconds because, again, my constant was in inverse seconds, so I know my time has to be seconds. Again, you can pause the video if you need to record the math. For a second order, again, we know that our rate is equal to K times the concentration squared. So using calculus, we get this integrated rate law. 
and on the AP exam on your formula sheet it takes that form. Same thing, just rearranged. So 1 over the concentration at time t minus 1 over the initial concentration is going to equal kt. For a zero order, you just need some reactants. Again, this, uh, the rate of the reaction is not dependent on concentration. So the rate is the rate constant times the concentration of a to the zero power, which in math we know anything to the zero power is one. So essentially, the rate equals the rate constant. So the integrated rate law is as such. The concentration at time t equals negative kt plus the initial concentration. This equation is not on the AP um, formula sheet, so I doubt they're going to ask you for a plug and chug type question, math question, but they could ask you, you know, here's a zero order reaction. What happens to the rate when we change the concentration of the reactant? And you would say nothing because it's not dependent on concentration. So now we can graph kinetics data, and when we rearrange the integrated rate laws to resemble y equals mx plus b, depending on when we get a straight line, we can figure out what the order of the reaction is. And this is what we'll be doing in lab. But let's look at, so a first order, this is my integrated rate law. If I rearrange it to match y equals mx plus b, then when I take a graph of the natural log of the concentration, or as we'll do in lab, the absorbance, versus time, a first order reaction will give us a straight line and the slope of that line will be the negative rate constant. If we graphed the natural log of the concentration versus time and did not get a straight line, it might end up like a curve and then we would know that that reaction is not first order. A second order, okay, if I rearrange the integrated rate law to match y equals mx plus b, and if I graph 1 over the concentration by time, I would get a straight line for a second order reaction, and the slope of that line would in fact be the rate law constant, k. A zero order reaction, the rate law is actually in y equals mx plus b form. And just straight and simple, if I graph the concentration versus time, that's when I would see my straight line. And the slope of that line would be negative the rate law constant. So again, you can graph kinetics data. And based on when you see a straight line, you, that will tell us the order of the reaction. And hopefully that makes a little more sense after we do the lab. So the last thing here is half-life. Since we now have incorporated time with concentration, there's this thing called half-life, the time it takes for the initial concentration of the reactants to go to half of the starting amount. And this is very common with nuclear chemistry. Nuclear decay, when we talk about radioactive isotopes, we often refer to their half-lives because that will tell us how long a radioactive isotope will remain radioactive. And you see here, we end up with what's called that asymptotic curve. Something that's radioactive never becomes completely unradioactive. It will, however, get to a level where it's safe. We're constantly exposed to radiation. So at some point, it'll get to a safe level. If you've ever heard of radiocarbon dating, radioactive carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. So we can look at a sample, and based on how much radioactive carbon is in it, we can figure out how old it is. But what a half-life does, again, we start with 100% of the reactant, or radioactive material. After one half-life, 50% is consumed, 50% has transferred into product. After another half-life, 75% is consumed. 25% is still there, still reactant, still radioactive. All right. Another half-life, well, that would be an additional 12.5%. So 87.5% is consumed, 
12.5% is left. But since we know that we want to know when the concentrations will be exactly one half, we can solve the integrated rate line. You can look in your book if you want to see the actual solution to this. But for a first order reaction, the half life is always going to be 0.693 divided by the rate law constant. And all of our nuclear decay reactions are pretty much first order decay, first order reaction, so we can always find the half life this way. And you'll notice that the half life is independent of initial concentration for a first order reaction, so it stays constant over time. That half life is always going to be a predictable amount of time. Oops, sorry. So here's a, an example. Sulfuryl chloride decomposes in a first order reaction. At this temperature, that's the rate constant because, of course, our constant is temperature dependent. What is the half-life? And we simply plug and chug. 0.693 divided by the constant. Since my constant is in inverse seconds, my half-life is going to come out in seconds. Piggybacking on that, how long in hours will it take for half of the original sulfuryl chloride to decompose? Well, half is the half-life, and we just found that out. So all we have to do is convert those seconds into hours, divide by 3,600. The next question says, how long in hours would it take for 75% to decompose? And if you remember from that graph I just showed you, that's another half-life. So another 8.75 hours, or 17 and a half hours total. For a second order reaction, our half-life equation looks like that. 1 over the rate constant times the initial concentration. So you'll notice, for a second order reaction, the half-life does depend on the initial concentration, and it increases over time. So if I have a second order reaction, and it takes 10 minutes for the first half-life to go by, it could take 20 minutes or 30 minutes or longer for the next half-life, and so on. Whereas for a zero-order reaction, my half-life equation is the initial concentration divided by 2K. And again, the initial concentration is involved, but this time our half-life decreases over time. So if my first half-life takes 10 minutes, the second half-life could take 2 minutes, and so on. So tying this all together, you do need to know this. You should know. This is on page 544 of your book. You need to know this, quote-unquote, memorize. Again, the equations will be on your equation sheet for the AP exam, but they're just listed there. You have to know which one is the first order, which one is the second order, etc. So this will be part of your quick check coming up. As far as the integrated rate laws are concerned, again, for the first and second order, those are the ones that are on the AP exam um, formula sheet, so you can use this form or you can use the form that I showed you in the notes that matches the AP formula sheet. But again, we're just looking at orders 0, 1, and 2. We don't need to go into 3s or anything others or negatives or halves. Um, and you can simply see a 0 order, the rate is equal to K. First order, K times the concentration to the first power. Second order is k times the concentration squared. Then there's your integrated rate law, the half-lifes that we just talked about, and when do you get a straight line plot. So for a zero order, it's concentration versus time. A first order, natural log of concentration versus time. And a second order, one over the concentration versus time. So again, you need to, to know that. Hopefully this helps. And I'll see you soon.